worship with you today. Let's all stand. I'm going to pray and then we're going to get started lifting up the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for your presence. God, we thank you that we get to lift you up together, Lord, that we get to gather in your house, Lord, and, and make your name glorious, God. And so I pray today as we worship you, you would be blessed by our praise, God, and you would work in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.
We just want to lift up your name today. That you would be magnified, Lord. In John 18, they came to arrest, they came to arrest Jesus. And they said, uh, who is it that you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. And he says, I am he. And when Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. I think we need a revelation of who Jesus is. And now throughout the book of John, Jesus referred to himself as the I am. And the Jews understood that to mean that he was God himself because God to Moses back in the book of Exodus, when Moses asked who he was, who's sending me, God told Moses to tell the people that I am who I am. So what I would like to do is I would like to in just complete silence, let us just acknowledge and wait upon the great I am. Lord, I pray that you would give us a spirit of understanding and revelation to know who you are. And God, we acknowledge this morning that we are standing in the presence of the great I am. Lord, reveal yourself to us. God, as we stand in the presence of a holy God, that all things, you hold all things every need, every heart, every person. God, we're in your presence, 
to meet the living God. Father, I pray that you would reveal yourself to us and meet us in this moment. Yours is 
Pastor Kalen came up and he talked about I am who I am. I really cannot be in God's presence. Jesse talked about it last week. My heart is not right sometimes. I confess, I repent to you, Lord.
I'm so dry, Lord. And I need a touch from you. The Bible says that if we confess our sins, times of refreshing will come. And I know for myself, probably in the last year, I just, Deb had a word this morning, morning, just languishing, just being in the sea, floating up and down and, and nothing to hold on to. And what I'm going to do for myself this morning is I'm just going to do some, I'm going to come to the altar here and I'm just going to repent of my sin. And I'm just praying times of confession, times of refreshing. And if you want to come do some work at the altar while they continue to worship, I invite you to do so.
Let's give the Lord a hand this morning. Jesus, Jesus. What a powerful name you are. What a powerful name. Amen. And Lord, we just thank you for this time and this opportunity to just be in your presence, Father. Thank you for times of refreshing, Lord. Lord, I believe you're doing something in this church. You're doing something in your people. Lord God, you are, you are touching hearts. You're healing people, Lord God. And we claim it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for being here at Church for the City. And now we're going to have some announcements. Hey, Church for the City. We're so excited to be here to worship with you today. We're, before we continue on, we have a couple of announcements. March 9th through 11th, we have our annual advanced conference. It is held in Great Falls this year. It's our leadership conference. And actually on the 12th, this Sunday, right after we have Pastor Jeff Eklund coming to share with us. You don't want to miss out on that. March 25th, ladies, we have If Table, If Gathering. You can sign up for that through the Faith E website. And we actually have a link for that in our Church Center app. So if you don't have the Church Center app, go ahead and download it. This is the perfect time for that because you can get more information through there. You can even get more information about date night that we have coming up. It's actually more of date day. We're going to go bowling right after church from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. Like I said, you can check more about that on our website, the app. You can sign up for our monthly emails or for our analog friends. We have paper copies in the lobby. However you stay connected, just stay connected. We love you guys so much. My son told me not to say that because I've done this like five times. But we really do love you guys. And we're going to continue on with the service now. Amen. Man, I love, uh, man, that was a great job, Paul. I love that. Even though it took you five takes, good job, right? That was awesome. Hey, we're going to take a couple of minutes to uh, greet one another, have a cup of coffee, all that good stuff. So we'll take a couple of minutes and do that. And I was reminded that is also Mid-City Week as well, right, Josh? All right, so let's do it.
Test, test one, two. You always can tell a church of love because they never come seated. They want to stay talking. <laughs> Let's all begin to come back together here. Let's continue our worship. You know, worship is more than songs. We're going to worship God in his word today. Um, let me... We're starting a new series today. And it's called I Am. I Am. Pastor Kalen covered that. I love the thing in the back, I am. It's going to talk about the seven I am's that Jesus made, his statements. And they're all found in the Gospel of John. It's interesting that the Gospel of John, was he wrote it for a purpose. It was the last Gospel written. And the men's, we've been doing a men's breakfast study. Um, we're already up into chapter eight. I have learned so much going through it. But what we find is the purpose of John and why he wrote that. But when we read that, it's the I am, and Kalen just talked about that. Now, I will tell you that Kalen assigned me the, the topic to talk about. He had no idea what my content was, and he just stole my sermon. <laughs> yeah. No, but we're going to talk about the great I am. Um, let's see how this goes here. Okay, good. There's the seven I am's of Christ we're going to talk about, and I would like to read those. Each of these are a theme. As I read John, I, each of the themes is about life. John talks about life. In fact, well, I, I'll get to it in a minute, but I'm going to talk today about the bread of life. And the bread of life speaks of the means by which we ac uh, acquire eternal life. I am the light speaks of our walk in the life followed as we follow the light that he presents to us. The door, Jesus says, I am the door. It speaks of how much life we get versus what the enemy gives which is death. I am the good shepherd, speaks of our source of life. I am the resurrection and the life, speaks of the life we now have and the future life that we will have. I am the way, the truth, and the life, speaks of the exclusivity of this life and the certainty of our life source. It's only through him. He's exclusively the way to life. And finally, I am the true vine, speaks of the results produced from our life in Christ. John talks about life. So John's purpose for his gospel. While John was a writer, and I just talked about this for our Bible class, so bear with me. John was the writer of, of the gospel of John, the apostle John. But it was the Holy Spirit that was the author. John wrote for his plan and purpose to the recipients, that was probably the believers that were in Ephesus or the church in Asia Minor, but he used his experiences, his vocabulary, his personality, his expressions, and yet it was the Holy Spirit that carried him along, according to 1 Peter, that was God breathed the words to use so that is truly God's word according to John's gospel. What are we doing here? There we go. You want to read some scriptures today? John 20, 30, and 31. John wrote about his purpose, and here's the purpose. Unfortunately, John put the purpose at the very last of his book. <laughs> It'd been nice to know beforehand. But when you get to the end, then you'll say, oh, that's what it was all about. But I'm going to give you a preview. It says, therefore... Many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. Understand that when John wrote the gospel, Jesus had done many miracles, many signs. The other gospels record some of those, and they don't record them all. But John recorded seven. Now, the, I don't know what it is with John. He liked the number seven. 
you read Revelation, also written by the Apostle John, everything in there is seven. But John talked about seven signs. We're going to talk about the seven I am's. But John wrote about seven miracles or signs. And this is why he wrote them. He says, but these, the seven, have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. That was John's purpose. His purpose was twofold, that you may believe. Believe what? Believe that he was the Messiah, the promised one of the Old Testament, and that you may believe he's the Son of God. Some people say, well, Jesus isn't God, he's just the Son of God. When you read John, you understand what the Son of God means. When I had a son, he was born from me. So he has my character and my nature and my substance. He's human. In many ways, he's like me, but he's his own man. So when we say the Son of God, recognize that Jesus is of the same nature and substance as God. So when we say Son of God, we're not saying a simple person. We're saying very God. And the early church fathers and the writers of Scripture fully understood that. And then the second is by believing you would have life in his name. There comes the fact of believing of what he has said. And through that, we get life. So let's get to our text. That was all free. John 6, 35. Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. I'm going to break this up today. In that one sentence, I am the bread of life, there's three different parts. I'm going to start with the I am part. Kaylin already preached. <laughs> the subject and the verb part. And then I'm going to jump down to the prepositional phrase, the bread. Actually, that's the part. I'll jump to, to of life. That's the, the participle part, of life. And then finally, I'll finish up with a predicate sentence, which is the bread. So it's a little bit out of order, but there's a reason for that. A method to my madness, if you will. Let's talk about this. I am. And this is what Kalen referred to, Exodus 3.14. God said to Moses, let me set it up. Moses is in the wilderness, 80 years old, tending sheep, comes upon a bush that's burning. It's on fire, but it's not burning away. And he says, I got to go see that. And as he approaches, God speaks to him and says, take your shoes off. This is holy ground. I'm now going to send you, Moses, to Egypt. I've heard the cries of my people and their distress, and they've cried out. And I am going to deliver them through you. And Moses says, uh, okay. Now remember, it's been 400 years. When Joseph died, he talked, he gave a prophecy about them being in, in captivity for 400 years. So it's been 400 years before that God has not spoken to the tribes. And now I was talking to Moses, and Moses says, well, what if I go and say to them, I'm here, and I'm, God sent me, he's the God of your fathers, Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac. And they say, well, what's his name? They don't know what his name is. What do I tell them? Verse 14, God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent you. Jesus uses the same word in an emphatic way of saying I am in these seven statements. They're tied to this verse here. We just worship God and the great I am. I don't know about you. Did you sense a presence or a, a, a weight? It's called the glory of God. It's almost like there's a, a weight here. 
That's the glory of God. It's just like his, the presence was here. This is the God of eternity, of limited power. One who is, who always was and always will be, who lives outside of time, who began time with a word, and one whose presence is everywhere. The one who knows everything, the end of the beginning, the creator of all that is seen and unseen, and it's all for his pleasure. The great I am. That's who sent Moses. And that is who Jesus claimed to be. John 8, 58 is a classic example. Jesus says to the Pharisees, Abraham was glad to see my day and he rejoiced in it. And they said, you're not, not, not yet 50 years old and you've seen Mo, um, Abraham? Jesus' response, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. What did he just claim? They understood it because they picked up rocks to stone them. We're stoning you for blasphemy because you're making yourself God. Uh-oh. <laughs> John 18, 5 and 6, another little sidetrack. This is when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane and they're about to arrest him. It's the scripture that Calen read. So there's this army that's come to arrest Jesus. Some debate, it was it Roman, was it temple guards? I don't know, but it was a big group of guys with swords and lanterns because they thought maybe he's going to run. And they asked, Jesus asked, whom are you looking for? And they, the army commanders, answered him, Jesus, the Nazarene, a very technical term. We want the Jesus, which was a common name, but we want the one from Nazareth. He said to them, I am he. And Judas also, who was betraying him, was standing with him. So when they said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Now, if you notice, I don't know if you can see it, but the he is in italics. And that's because it's a, the subject is supplied. I'm sorry, the object is supplied, that pronoun. In the Greek, it's not there. What he said literally was, ego a me, a very emphatic, I am. And when Jesus said that, there was a response. These mighty battle and battle soldiers that had no fear fell backward to the ground. It wasn't because they were fearful. It was because when Jesus said, I am, the power of God in that statement knocked them to the ground. When Jesus uses that term, I am, he is declaring himself to be the eternal one by using the divine, neighbor, na, divine name for himself. So let's move on here. He says, I am the bread of life. Let's talk about of life. And I said, John's gospel should be called the gospel of life, I think. The word life is used in Matthew 16 times. The word life is used in Mark eight times. The word life is used in Luke 15 times. How many times do you think it's used in John? 47. <laughs> nice. 47 times. There's a seven there. What do you think John was trying to get across? So before we do that, we have to start at the beginning. Let's start at the beginning. Adam and Eve were given immortality. Now, there was a church father around 319 AD. His name was Athanasius, who became the champion defender of the doctrine of the incarnation. And by incarnation, that word simply means in flesh. And the doctrine was debated 
and there were errors that started to po populate the church or bubble up in the church. And Arius was one of them, an error that said Jesus was a created being. Jesus was a super angel, if you will. He wasn't God, he was just made by God. And then God used this super angel to create everything else. That was Arius' stand. Athanasius was our hero. He stood up. And I started, I started walking because I'm preparing for a trip to Israel. And I'm looking for something. I usually listen to music. And I was going through and my, my Bible program has an audio. Oh, there's a, there's a book by Athanasius. And it's called The Incarnation of the Word of God. Oh, I'm going to listen to that. So I boom, start walking and listen to that. And he got to this point. And he began to make that point. And I had always understood it here. But when he read that, that they were made immortal. They were made so that they would never die. God gave, the, actually the word says, is God not merely created man, but also gave him the grace of a likeness to the divine life. The Bible says that Adam was created in the image of God, and there's debates on what that image represents. One of them, I believe, is that he was given the very divine life of God within him, the, the immortal. Now, Adam wasn't from the beginning like God. Adam began when he was formed from the earth. When God breathed that breath of life into his nostrils, he became an immortal being. And that was his purpose and plan, was that we would live forever in God's presence. Genesis 2.17, God's command to Adam, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. And the word, the way that's presented in the Hebrew is dying you shall die. It's very clear. You will die. In dying, you will die. So he endowed him with an exceptional gift of being in God's image, for he placed in him paradise and promised him celestial bliss conditionally on his perseverance and grace. And on the other hand, death was made the penalty of transgression, and not death simply, but death and the continuance in the corruption of death. This was the phrasing of a judge issuing the death sentence. You'll find it in Jeremiah 26, 8. In dying you shall die. And when I read, when I was listening to that, I don't call it a vision, but an illumination where it went from here to here. And there was a flash, just this little picture in my mind, maybe you've seen it. When he said that, have you ever, do you have a computer power supply you plug in and it has a little light on it? And you plug it in and the light's there. And then you say, oh, and you unplug it from the wall. And the light's still on. And you watch it. And then suddenly it blinks out. And it's like God put that in the picture in my mind. That when they ate that fruit, that eternal life, that light that was within them blinked out and for the first time I grieved in that I said, Adam what did you do and the Bible teaches that we all now are born as a power supply with no LED we're born in death we're born in corruption because of Adam that's important to understand the concept of death. When, when they took that bite and that light blinked out, here's what it meant. They died spiritually. The soul lost God. When they bit that apple, they say, well, God, didn't you abide by your word? They should have fell down dead right there. And they didn't. They kept on going. But they became aware of who they were. They became aware of their sin. They became aware of right and wrong. Their soul lost God. That light blinked out. 
Physically, they continued, but corruption began to come. They would eventually die. The, the soul would leave the body. The two aspects of death. There is a third aspect of death the Bible teaches, and that's called the second death. And that is eternal, an eternal death. Jesus spoke more about hell than he talked about heaven. He came to give us life. He came to bring that little LED back on for us. When I was started out reading John, this one always bugged, not bugged me, but I, it's like I couldn't get a grasp. I'm, I tell people, I'm, I'm a concrete thinker. I think, was it right brain? You know, other people, the artists are left brain or something like that. I think hard on concrete. And so I couldn't grasp this hard enough until that little revelation. And then it all fit together for me. It says, when Jesus came into the world, it says, in him was life. And the life was the light of men. The light of men, the little LED that comes on. And the light shines, and that word means continuously. The light is always shining in the darkness. And the darkness has not overcome it. And that's, in the Greek, there's different ways the verb is used. When it says the light shines, that's a continuous, ongoing process. But when it says it could not overcome it, that's a one little thing. The enemy is attacking you, attacking the light every time. It cannot overcome it, cannot understand it. That's what death brought. Let's get it going here. Here we go. But here's life. Here's what happened. The soul gains God. We are reborn. Physically, we now show the new life within us. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Don't put it under a basket. You're supposed to shine. That's what God gave you life for. And then we get new ones at the end. We get new bodies. This body that's physical dies. The corruption, there's nothing that can save that part of it. It will die. But God promised that you will be raised again with a new one. The one that will never be corrupt. And thirdly, you receive eternal life. That is never-ending life in the presence of God. The way we were designed, the way we were built, the way Adam had initially. I now want to take Adam into the back alley and teach him a thing or two. <laughs> what do you do, Adam? John 1, 1 and 2 says that. This is 1 John. He wrote three letters as well. So... He, Again, if you see his personality, you see his themes, you'll recognize that this is the same as the gospel. That which was in the beginning. In other words, John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was God, or the Word. So, that from which was in the beginning, which we have heard and which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands, concerning the Word of life. The life was made manifest. And we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with us, or I'm sorry, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. What does the word manifest mean to you? Are you familiar with that term? It's like I got something in my hand here. Do you know what it is? I am now going to manifest it to you. The life was manifested to us. It says in John chapter 14, the word became flesh and dwelt or tabernacled among us and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John is writing here saying, I saw it. I touched him. I heard him. I saw the life. I saw what he did and it's real and that eternal life is here. This John's letter was written to all the Christians in Asia Minor. Finally, John 10.10, 10. this is what Jesus says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. That's why Jesus came to give us life. Not just barely life, but abundant life. More than you would expect or anticipate. 
God wants to give you life, eternal life, life that is now and life that is in the future. Those of you that have accepted Christ, you know what I'm talking about. There's a life within you. The spirit comes to dwell within you. God himself is indwelling within us. 2 Corinthians 4, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, this is Paul writing, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested, there's that word again, in our bodies. That life isn't supposed to stay in here. That life is supposed to come out and people are supposed to see that life in us. For we who live, the living ones literally, are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake. We go through trials, troubles, tribulations. And we do that, and God does that, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. So we're going through the hard times, and God promised that we will go through hard times and tribulation. And you read the, read the Bible, they didn't have an easy road. They got beat up, they got killed and martyred. And that's going on today in other parts of the world. It's beginning somewhat in America. We think, oh, they're persecuting me because I can't read something. And it's like, you have no idea. I think we need to be aware. In the same way, the Bible says in Matthew, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to God, your Father, who is in heaven. The life. Now let's finally talk about the bread. So we've talked about the I am, that Jesus is the eternal God. We've talked about the life that he came. It wasn't just that he brought life, it's that he was life. And he brought, and he gives it to us. But how does he do that? Let's talk about the bread. John 6, 48. Truly, truly, I say to you, now this is the section that comes after the one I read about. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. He repeats it. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. By this, he's referring to himself. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Now, John never writes in his gospel, never writes about, he writes about the Last Supper, but he never gives us details about the, the cup and the bread. This is the only instance that he mentions that. And if you read this in the wrong light, you'll say, oh, if I'm taking that cup and eating that bread, I, I got life. He's given me life. And it's not what it says. That is a representation of what Jesus is doing for us. Matthew 4 says, and this is the key. The tempter came and said to Jesus, he's in the wilderness, he's being tempted, and Satan comes to him and is beginning his temptations. If, if you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread, because he was fasting for 40 days. But he answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. That's the beginning key for understanding when Jesus says, I am the bread of life. We don't eat his body, although some churches believe that. So what does that mean? It's interesting that in Deuteronomy, I guess it's the next one here. Let's, let's, right here. Get this. This is when a man, or he's recounting to the Israelites what they went through. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you known that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Jesus was hungry. And he is thinking about this verse here. So when he quoted it, he's quoting what's written. Bread, what I eat, is not going to make me live. It's the word of God and that bread is what's going to make me live. It's going to give me life. 
And here was the ultimate key. And when Jesus said this, he, he, he even goes further. When he's talking to these people, he goes further. He says, I'm going to give my flesh as bread. They say, we're going to eat your flesh. And Jesus says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part in me. And it's like, this is a hard saying. I can't understand it. And it says many of his disciples left over that. It offended them. The 12 stayed. And they said, Jesus turned to them and said, you're not going to leave too, are you? And he says, Lord, where will we go? You are the one that have the words of eternal life. They re he recognized, the disciples recognized. It wasn't the bread that Jesus had done just a little bit earlier, making bread for the 5,000. It wasn't the manna that came down that fed them and they died. It was him, the bread, and the word that he spoke. It says, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken about eating my flesh, drinking my blood, to you are spirit and life. That's what they are. They're spirit. They're spiritual things. That is the purpose, his life and death and resurrection and his teachings. Then as we were eating and drinking him, we are partaking of everything he is. And this is a spiritual process that changes our spirit and has ramifications in the natural world that will bring true life to us. The Holy Spirit now comes to reside in us, change us, and guide us by his word. That was the life. The bread of life is all that Jesus has spoken. That's what it is. And all that Jesus is. Like manna, daily we take it with gratitude. Manna would rot in, in one day. The next day it would be full of worms. Because the words I give you, you need this every day. You need to continually sustain on Jesus, on who he is, on what he did, and what he says. Because only then can the Spirit begin to deal in your life and begin to change your life and give you more and more of the new life. And so that it doesn't, I don't want to take too heavy of a doctrine, that it doesn't blink again. There are people that ignore God's word and they get distracted and they drift away. And God is saying, I want you to daily eat the bread of life because that's what I've come to give you. So here's what it is. Number one, how do we eat the bread of life? We come to him. We come to God himself. We come to the Lord Jesus Christ, the I am. And he's the one that gives it to us. Number two, we believe in him. Believe in his resurrection. Believe in his death. Believe in that he has given me life. And that I choose to follow him. It's a commitment that I will follow you, Lord. And finally, number three, receive the words of life. And that means, ooh, there's that nasty word. Obey. It's interesting that, the, that early in Acts, they would talk about the Gentiles and people that were coming to the Lord. And they use a phrase that says, they became obedient to the faith. That's the way they described them. Does that describe us? We have become obedient to the faith. That's where our life is. So finally in closing, the bread of life is the means by which we receive eternal life. It's through Jesus. We come to him. We believe in him. We accept what he has to say about who he is and the way he wants to present it to us. That's the means that we receive eternal life. And so now finally in closing, I want to ask you, will you take this bread of life? There's some of you here that have already partaken of that. You've taken Jesus, his life into your, your being. God's spirit has changed you. It's causing you to grow. He's leaving that old life behind, that, that darkness, that death. And now we're walking into a new light, a new life. But I believe there's some here that may not have ever done that. And I'm going to ask you this morning, I'm going to ask you to bow your head, close your eyes. I'm asking for the presence of God here. The Holy Spirit was given to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. 
God's spirit is here dealing with our hearts. I know that because he has said that's what he does. And I've experienced it myself. So this morning, maybe you're experiencing that. God is dealing with your heart on life and you've never been part of a life. You've lived in darkness. You've lived in death. Things just never go your way. And God is calling you to life. There's a light that he's holding up to you. Is there anybody here this morning that is willing to come to him to believe the words that he has said, to accept, accept him, and then begin to follow him in obedience to him? May I ask you to raise your hand? Is there anyone here that would like to do that? God's spirit is dealing with you. I'm going to move on, but I just give you one more time. Okay. Now, let me ask you this. Is there anyone here that you receive that eternal life? And maybe you, it's starting to go dim in your life. You've let the world, you've let things crowd your way. You've not obeyed of what God has told you to do, what he's revealed in his word to you. You begin to walk away from that. And you say, God, I want to come back. I want to experience that life, that eternal life that's in you. Is there anyone here that would like to do that this morning? Anyone? Okay. I see some hands. All right. I'm going to pray. And I'm going to ask you to repeat after me. Those of you that raise your hands, this is something that you, from your being, is responding to God's spirit. It's a form of repentance is what we're going to pray. Let's begin. Lord Jesus, I come to you now in repentance. Lord, I, I now see that I have sinned against you. And Lord, I'm sorry for my sins. I'm sorry for the things that I have done. And God, I now confess that you were right and that you are the one that gives eternal life. I now ask that you would cleanse me, change me, draw me again to your presence. And God, I ask that you would build within me that hatred of the sin that so easily came upon me. I now turn to you and I believe that you have the words of eternal life. I thank you for that refreshing. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's praise God. Thank you, God. Amen. So I'm just going to dismiss you. Um, thank you for your attention. We're going to have a thing up there on the way to give. There's a way of giving. That's part of the obedience part. Um, and Lord bless you. And consider the great I am this week. Amen.